Sorry, hey, uh, Nicole, can you hear me in there? Uh, do you want me to be in there calling for the supers, maybe? Because we don't, for at least the first half of the package, because we don't have hit times. Kristen's adding them, so we should be good. Kristen's adding them? Okay. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Monday, September 16th. Clearly their time here uh, has come to an end. What? A longtime scrap metal recycler reaches a deal with the city to close up shop at its location next to Lincoln Yards and move operations to the far south side. The reparations debate is heading to city council. Online giant Amazon says it's adding 400 jobs to its Chicago office. That and more local business news from Cranes. A new book ties the ascent of President Donald Trump to the evolution of American television. Heavenly Tiffany windows on view in a historic Chicago mansion. Is higher education failing America's young people? Meet a writer who's been looking for ways to improve it. Look at that. Beautiful. And it's we ride along with a Chicago beekeeper whose unique business is buzzing this season. And a proposed congestion tax for drivers traveling downtown has some of you pumping the brakes. We hear your thoughts in tonight's viewer feedback. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brandis, Fries Brandis Friedman. Now we're heading to Carol Marine in a debate heading to the city council. Carol. Brandis, thank you. A new resolution on reparations is scheduled to be introduced in city council this week. This follows the introduction of a resolution in Congress that would allow a commission to develop various proposals on how to compensate the descendants of American slaves. Reparations could take a lot of forms. One of those forms could be cash from the government. However, 67% of all Americans are opposed to such payments, according to a recent Gallup poll. However, 73% of black Americans say the government should do exactly that. Here to talk about the Chicago resolution, Alderman Roderick Sawyer of the Sixth Ward. He's also the chairman of the City Council's Black Caucus and the Reparation Bill sponsor. Former chairman. Former chairman, forgive me, thank you for that correction. And Alderman Nicholas Pizzato of the 38th Ward, who's opposed to the city providing cash reparations. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, thank Carol. Always a pleasure to be in. So, Alderman Sawyer, why don't you start with what does this proposal of yours do exactly? To be exact, the proposal is a resolution asking for us to form a commission to, to implement reparations for enslaved Africans that live currently in the city of Chicago. It's not asking for a cash payout. Is asking for us to help repair what's been done to enslaved Africans over the centuries that we've been enslaved from 1619, the oppressive Jim Crow laws, the black codes, all the things that have been oppressive to black people all this time. We need help in repairing ourselves to get us back into the mainstream and be productive citizens. Everything that goes on right now that we talk about, good or bad, if it's good, we're at the bottom of the pile. If it's bad, we're at the top. We need to right those wrongs, and those wrongs are based on the effects of slavery. But you're not ruling out, so you, you form a commission that mm -hmm. undertakes to explore how to address this, but it doesn't rule out the possibility of some sort of, of financial benefit package or, or cash reparations, does it? Yes, I sent a copy of the resolution mm -hmm. in advance, and it's based on the five pillars that were uh, implemented under the national program, and I want to thank in Cobra and Dr. Conrad Worrell and other people that have been really helpful in us formating, f formulating this. But it's into the non-repetition and cessation, compensation, rehabilitation, these types of things that are involved in the ordinance. So it's not just money, it's much more than that. So Alderman Spazzato, where do you fall on this? Well, uh, it's, it, it, it's not compensation as he says, but it'll take money to do all of those things. So we're in big financial trouble right now in the city, uh, 838 um, um, million in debt. 
Um, so where are we going to get the money to pay for this? Uh, whenever it's resolved, this shouldn't be something resolved at the city level. It should be more of a federal thing. And exactly who is entitled to it? Can somebody come from a suburb and say they're going to move to Chicago now and they're entitled to it? I mean, you know, there's not that much clarity on there for me. But the bottom line, it'll be a major, major financial burden upon the city of Chicago. So Alderman Sawyer, what about that? It will be a financial price to pay. That's absolutely correct. But I don't think it's a burden if it's relieving some of the stresses that we've incurred because of enslavement to the uh, African-American citizenry. What's happened is the things that we talk about that we're contribute to the budget, overtime for police, uh, mental health services, things that we're additionally having to pay for, additional cops. I think we could resolve a lot of that if we can repair what's going on in the African-American community. And I think a lot of it is based on the enslavement of us and the mindset that we still have, both black and white. I mean, we're just getting under equity, I mean, we, equality, I say right now, because based on the civil rights lacks, that was where we b finally became equal. That was in the 60s. I was born at that time. We're only 50 years out of that. So now we're talking about equity. And I'll equate that very quickly if uh, my good friend Nick and I right now were to run a race. You know, unfortunately, Nick is in the wheelchair. You know, I'm not fast, but I think I can beat Nick. But we're two guys, two grown guys. We started the same place. We ended the same place. I can probably beat him right now. That's, but that's not fair. That's not equitable. That's equal, but it's not equitable. So the argument that, and, I, and, and Alderman Sposato, I know you had a conversation with our producer before you went on, as did you, mm -hmm. Alderman Sawyer. But one of the arguments, and I know you two are friends, yes. but what you point out, Alderman Sposato, is that you came from a prominent political family. Your dad was the mayor. Alderman Sposato's dad had many struggles, right? Yep. And that loving parents, loving dad and mother and father, but they financially struggled their whole life, so. So how do how do you work out for it when you look at the Gallup poll and says mm -hmm. a, an overwhelming number of all Americans are opposed to this? How do you how do you sort this out Listen, and heal? If the things? people in Chicago, first of all, this was the, the biggest black guy in America ever, so I'm not trying to act like that this was okay. I mean, it was, I mean, it was just a, a tragedy. It just the things that happen when I read books and watch movies about what happened are just, it hard, it's hard beyond comprehension to believe that a human being could do something like that to another human being. But if people are for this, my solution would be, let's let the people pay for it. They want to do it. Maybe you could pay some extra money for taxes. Maybe businesses will say, look, we support this. We feel we made money off of slaves in the past and they're willing to pay for it. If that's the case, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not going to. You're against taxpayer money. I'm against taxpayer dollars paying for this. And, and you're I not. I think that the very reason that Nick just stated is the reason that we should have conversation about it. That exact reason, you know, how do we pay for it? I'm not saying I have all the answers. Uh, uh, when I first did this, the first variation of our ordinance was roundly criticized by the reparations movement, and rightfully so, because it wasn't consistent with what they believed in and what they've advocated for. So they assisted us in crafting a bill that's similar to H.R. 40, which is the federal resolution, which the state has embraced, the city has in early 2000s. We even came up with a slavery disclosure ordinance in 2002, thanks to Alderman Dorothy Tillman. But the bottom line is we have not gone far enough to talk about a full conversation about reparations. That's all I want to do right now. Let's talk about what it looks like, see if we can do it, if we can pay for it, if we need state or national help. But it would, it'll never happen if we don't start the conversation. Do you disagree with that, Alderman Spazano? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't disagree with that, but I just dis disagree with the city paying for it. Who's eligible? Does somebody move from the suburbs? Can they be eligible? Uh, somebody that's biracial, are, are they eligible? I mean, where, where, do, where do we draw the lines over here? I'm not really sure about it, but, you know, if they, yeah, I just, you know, government money, you know, a public money paying for something like this, I, I just don't, I don't But again, think. part of the conversation. But do, do you disagree with the notion that, um, that the, the, the legacy of slavery has, has extended all the way until now with the way of, of black unemployment, black incarceration. Black employment's at the least amount that it's ever been right now in America. So black, black but compared unemployment to, is going but down compared all the to time. white employment? It's, it's still very, very high, in, especially in certain areas of the city. Area where I represent Inglewood could be as high as 40% unemployment and it is I think a direct cause of, of the enslavement of, of Africans people of African descent 
Is the city well, council going to, so would you, are you voting against this resolution? Well, I, I don't think it's going to be a roll call vote. I'll, I'll, I'll tell my good friend that I'm against it and he'll say, you know, uh, I don't think it'll be 49 to 1. I think it'll probably be 47 to 3. So um, once, uh, you know, he does it, I, I don't, I'm sure it's not going to be a roll call, but I'll just ask but him. But you'll be one you know, of the three, I'm, but then I'm you'll not, do it by acclamation? Right. Well, whatever. I'm, I'm not going to be there banging my chest and starting to fight with all my friends and everything, of course, unless mm -hmm. somebody tries to pick a fight with me or, or, or the other people that are against it. But I'm not expecting than any but you know, big what, what war I'm with each other. What is that we have a robust enough conversation where I can get Nick to understand why it's important. But at the same and that's what I'm hoping for. There are those who feel that this kind of debate could widen the divide yep. as opposed to close yep. the divide because that's, that's it exactly might myself. polarize the sides further than they're already polarized. Pushing a wedge I, between us, between blacks and whites even more now with something like this than it's ever been. So. And I think just the opposite. I think repressing it is even going to make it worse. So I think that we need to talk about it. I, I really thank, you know, Dr. Wilson, for example, who is bringing it to the forefront. But uh, Willie I really Wilson, think, who yes. ran for mayor. Yes, but uh, Cam Howard, I really want to say a special thank you to him for because he really helped me understand how, you know, for the last 120 years, we've been talking about reparations and we still have not even scratch the surface yet. Well, what's and interesting to me is that there is disagreement within the reparations community. Like you had one idea, mm -hmm. they've had others, and well, that that isn't a, a homogenous Well, I, I point consider of myself view. a novice. I was one just, you know, was gung-ho about it, but once I started talking to representatives of the, of the reparations movement, one thing they did inform me about, there were Italians that got reparations here in the United States. Well, in aren't you Italian? I sure am Italian. And my, <laughs> my family had it pretty rough at the turn of the century, but that's not that what this is about. But I just want to make it yeah. perfectly clear. I have the utmost respect for Alderman Sawyer and Dr. Wilson also. So, And so this will go to a vote for this resolution, correct, yes. on Wednesday? No, no. It just, be, it just gets oh, introduced, just introduced on Wednesday, that's all. And go, I'm expecting us to have vigorous debate and conversation about it again. I'm hoping to have my good friend and I talk to him about this, talk about the Italian reparations, for example, that, that occurred in the 1890s. And I'll say this one last thing, uh, and I did come from a, a wonderful family, but I, I do remember this when I was a kid, 19, early, mid-1960s, where we had to sit downstairs, not in the main dining room, where my father tried to take us out to eat dinner. So this happened in my lifetime. So the conversation is not over yet. And can we, be pretty we've complicated. Got, we've gotten much better from things like that in the past with the cafeterias, where what, what, what went on in those days, and the water fountains, and the p pools, and everything else. So we've we've overcome a lot of that stuff. So but we, we're, we're not we get better all the time. Finished. So this discussion has already begun. <laughs> Alderman Sawyer, Alderman Spazzato, thanks always for being in Chicago you. tonight. Thank you. Thanks, There's much more ahead. Stay with us. Chicago tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. The city's reacting to what some are calling a public health crisis. Amanda Venicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Brenda, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot is calling for a ban of all flavored electronic cigarette products. Critics say vape juice flavors like cherry, cinnamon, and bubble gum entice youth. At least one alderman, Raymond Lopez of the 15th Ward, wants to go further. He's introducing a plan that would forbid all sales of e-cigarettes and their refill cartridges. The crackdown comes after a mysterious string of vaping-related illnesses. Critics say vaping is still a smarter alternative for smokers than regular cigarettes. For more on this story, visit our website. A political consultant owes the city $25,000 for failing to register as a lobbyist. According to a federal affidavit uncovered by the Chicago Sun-Times in 2015, Roberto Caldero gave Viagra to and arranged massage parlor visits for then alderman Danny Solis. This while at the same time asking Solis to help one of Caldero's clients, a street sweeping company. The Chicago Board of Ethics determined that counts as unregistered lobbying. It's fining Caldero $25,000. Solis didn't run for re-election. He's been under the radar since. 
Gambling regulators say Illinois legislators should go back to the drawing board on terms for a Chicago casino. That's after a study last month found the tax structure lawmakers designed for a future casino is so high, developers won't be able to make a profit. Today, members of the Illinois Gaming Board voted to recommend the state legislature modify the terms of a future Chicago casino, but they gave no insight on how it should change. The Federal Communications Commission has given the all clear for Nexstar to buy the Tribune Media Group. That clears all regulatory hurdles for a sale after an earlier bid by Sinclair was canceled. Once the sale is finalized, WGN TV and radio will, for the first time, no longer be owned by a Chicago company. As for the weather, expect some fog late tonight, otherwise mostly cloudy with a low around 63 and more fog early tomorrow morning, then partly sunny skies with a high near 78. And now, Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, a new book by the New York Times chief television critic links President Trump's ascent with the evolution of American television. Tiffany treasures that focus on the spiritual in a historic Chicago home. And right now, we're actually going to go to uh, Paris Shuts. So after dozens of hurdles, the controversial Lincoln Yards project uh, and related uh, $1.3 billion TIF is a done deal. Now, that's because the state court judge threw out a lawsuit attempting to stop it. But while that moves forward, another piece of industrial property right next to Lincoln Yards is about to become the next front in the battle over redevelopment, the environment, and the discrepancies between the north and south sides. Paris Schutz reports. General Iron is a scrap metal recycling company that has operated along the north branch of the Chicago River near Cortland and Clybourne for more than 60 years. It shreds and recycles 750,000 tons of metal each year, much of it from cars, trucks, and buses. General Iron says it performs a valuable environmental service for the city. This material that goes through the metal shredder here ends up being used in manufacturing new metal uh, products and goods like automobiles and raw iron and steel products that we use every day. And it saves nat uh, energy and natural resources in that process while avoiding putting all this material in landfills. The company is the last vestige of an industrial past tucked between the Tony neighborhoods of Lincoln Park and Bucktown, and it abuts the new proposed Lincoln Yards development. It has had a contentious relationship with some of its neighbors who have complained about air pollution from dust and particulate matter winding up in streets, porches, and backyards. This weekend, Second Ward Alderman Brian Hopkins collected fluff, which he says is a toxic tumbleweed of carcinogenic substances emitted from General Iron. It's a health hazard to the neighborhood, and even though improvements have been made, if you're admitting less toxic material than you once were, is it a glass half full or a glass half empty, you're still admitting toxic material. Last week, the Lightfoot administration finalized a deal long in the works for General Iron to close up shop by the end of next year, and it imposes strict new environmental regulations on the company. Earlier this summer, General Iron installed a $2 million regenerative thermal oxidizer, which it says reduces the emissions of volatile organic compounds by 98% and instead lets out water vapor. It says it is in compliance with all EPA standards of particulate matter and lead emission. But the company says no system is 100% fail-safe. Obviously, uh, we can't control all of the dust, and so some dust leaves. But dust is not the same as what the bigger concerns are with particulate matter and metal products and volatile organic compounds, and those we have under control and meet and exceed EPA requirements in those areas. Hopkins says the city can shut the plant down any time if it falls out of compliance. Hopkins and Lincoln Park Alderman Michelle Smith say they won't be sad to see the plant go. Smith says the city missed out on a prime opportunity to turn the newly vacant Finkel Steel land into a public park when developer Sterling Bay won approval to build the massive Lincoln Yards development. But she says the city has a second chance with the General Iron site. The city needs to decide whether it simply wants to have more relentless development in one of the most congested areas of the city or whether or not we want to use our city resources to create a true public benefit. This 
24 acre North Branch Park and Preserve. General Iron is being sold to another Chicago recycler called RMG. It will follow the fate of Finkel Steel and move to the south side near 116th and Burley along the Calumet River. The plant will be located here at a recycling facility already owned by RMG. It's set back about a quarter of a mile from the nearest road. The company is vowing a new state-of-the-art facility where all the metal shredding is done indoors. What's on Clybourne is not coming to the 10th Ward. Um, they are upgrading, they are actually going to be making, um, RMG is going to actually be making an existing facility better. 10th Ward Alderman Susan Sadlowski-Garza says she approves of the company's move into her southeast side ward, even though the area has faced a glut of environmental problems from other industrial plants. We have to recycle. Um, am I happy, you know, that it's coming here? Um, I'm happy that we got the restrictions that we need to make sure that our residents are safe. But that's not good enough for some residents, like Peggy Salazar, who heads up the Southeast Side Environmental Task Force. She says the move follows a familiar pattern. While the North Side gets showered with TIF projects and new parks, the South Side gets the scraps. Don't send us a business nobody else wants. It's very clear that the alderman Hopkins didn't have confidence in them being able to do it. Otherwise, he would have allowed them to stay. But General Iron and RMG say the new site is tailor-made for their recycling facility, thousands of feet from any residential area, an investment in a neighborhood that sorely needs it. The companies say that all of the 100 employees that currently work at the General Iron plant on the north side are offered jobs at the new plant on the south side. And Garza, Alderman Woman Garza, has been assured that there'll be union jobs. And in Paris, why is the company moving to the south side? Remember a few years ago, you know, this whole industrial corridor along Chicago River on the north side was rezoned from industrial to residential and business and commercial so that Lincoln Yards could be built. So General Iron says, we see the writing on the wall. We're not wanted here anymore. We're going to pack up shop and go where it's more appropriate to have industrial space. And how would the city go about acquiring that land? Well, this land could be anywhere from 100 and 200 million dollars. So General Iron owns the land now. You heard Alderman Smith says we need to make this into a 24 acre park. They could just purchase it with some of that TIF money or Alderman Smith says they could go to court and seize the land, pay a fair market value, take the land for themselves in a kind of eminent domain deal. Obviously, the owner wants to get whatever they can get, have people bid for that land because it's very valuable. All right, Paris, thank you very much. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, a new book by the New York Times chief television critic links President Trump's ascent with the evolution of American television. Tiffany treasures that focus on the spiritual in a historic Chicago home. Is the higher education system failing low-income students and students of color? One education journalist on how colleges makes or breaks you. We meet a Chicago beekeeper whose business model is buzzing this season. And vinyl records are making a comeback, and for the first time in 30 years, they're being made in Chicago. We hear your thoughts on their return. But first, some of today's top business headlines from Cranes. Here's Ann Dwyer. Brandis, Amazon is roughly doubling the number of employees in its Loop office. They're adding 400 new jobs and 70,000 square feet of new space. But these aren't warehouse jobs we're talking about. They're new hires that will work in fields including cloud computing, advertising, and business development. There are currently more than 400 employees working in Amazon's Chicago office at 227 West Monroe Street, supporting the company's web services, advertising, transportation, and operations units. The new Chicago jobs are among more than 30,000 positions Amazon is working to fill nationwide. After years of legal battles, United Airlines and Expedia have called a truce in their feud over online ticket sales. The agreement ends a standoff in which the airline had threatened to withdraw from one of the Internet's largest travel sellers. United, which had said it would withhold fare data from Expedia starting at the end of this month, disclosed last week that the two parties were discussing a new contract. The deal announced today covers an undisclosed period of time. Airlines and ticket sellers have tussled for years over distribution costs as airlines have sought to sell off more of their own tickets directly to customers.
and Chicago-based Cresco Labs, one of the leaders in the growing cannabis industry, today announced plans to acquire a company which owns, among other things, the busiest marijuana dispensary in Las Vegas. Cresco is paying $227 million in stock and $55 million in cash to purchase trike companies, dramatically expanding its presence in Nevada, one of the fastest growing recreational marijuana markets in the country. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann Dwyer. Back to you, Brandis. And thank you. Now to Amanda Vinicky and the chief New York Times television critic. Amanda. What if the best lens through which to understand President Donald Trump isn't populist politics or his perceived business prowess, but instead the nature and evolution of American television? That's the premise of a new book by the New York Times chief television critic James Poniewozik. It's called Audience of One. Donald Trump, television, and the fracturing of America. Thanks so much and welcome to Chicago tonight. Now, you write in your book that Donald Trump that America knows is a character, that he wasn't a businessman, he played one on TV. What do you mean by that? Uh, I mean that his entire adult public career, television, image, celebrity, has been the point of Donald Trump. Uh, you know, he said early in his business career, I'm going to go into real estate, but I'm going to bring show business into real estate. And that has been, you know, before the campaign, before Fox News, before even The Apprentice, uh, the, 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 the big enterprise, his, the biggest thing he ever constructed was the persona of Donald Trump, the character, which he did by making himself a ubiquitous presence in the tabloids, in the talk shows, and in the media generally. He built Trump Tower, but he built his reputation right up there and even, in fact, above it. Now, the book pins the evolution of President Trump to the evolution of American TV. What is a standout moment that helps explain that? Um, you know, the, the book is really two stories. It's how Donald Trump created himself as a character, and it's how we got to the point where somebody like Donald Trump you know, the host of The Apprentice could get elected president. And that is... Some people would not have ever imagined. Yeah, and, and, and that is a journey from basically his early days as a public figure to the fragmented niche media era in which he ran for president and won. Uh, and one thing that really struck me when I was researching the book was I came across an old interview of his with Rona Barrett uh, on NBC that she taped in 1980. And she was the first, the gossip columns was the first person to, that it occurred to ask, would you ever run for president? And he said no, because he said in, in the era of television, uh, somebody who might be a controversial figure could never win because TV you know, favors somebody with a big smile and uh, just a telegenic face. And the thing was, he was not wrong at the time. Television itself had to change a lot before it could get to the point where a very polarizing combative figure could become a polarizing combative figure in television and use that as a springboard to power. So we focus on the change in politics. You're focusing on the change in television and television habits. Absolutely. How much of Donald Trump's approach to TV, to the media, was calculated? How much of it was sheer luck? I think a lot of it is instinct. I think he, he thinks like a television camera. Uh, you know, which is to say, and this is, you know, this is absolutely a talent and a skill. Um, you know, he knows what it is that presses the media's buttons and gets attention on him. Controversy, uh, you know, confrontation, uh, a sort of swaggering, entertaining figure, which he was doing way back in the 80s. That was, that was his persona. You know, I don't think that he had a grand scheme to rise from son of a New York real estate developer to president of the United States necessarily, but I think that he did always have a sense of chasing the spotlight and moving that to something bigger and had the intuition that in television, in a television culture, it's much more important to appear like a thing than to actually be that thing to appear like people's you know, mental image of this is what a fabulous rich guy looks like than necessarily to be the most successful businessman in New York. It was the image. Now, does TV need President Trump or does Trump need TV? Who's using who? It is a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship. Television gives him attention and material. Uh, it made him possible basically, and he gives it ratings. 
uh, you know, and you saw that symbiosis play out, you know, obviously today, but uh, in his campaign, when you would have cable news networks showing the empty podium that he was about to speak at because he was a gold mine for them. It was just a good, good gush, you know, the news was breaking any time that he opened his mouth. And that is what, you know, cable news needs. It needs constant excitement. It needs to tell people that there is news even when there isn't news. And he was breaking news, breaking news constantly. Exactly. And he was, you know, breaking news by you know, sort, of, sort of breaking the political rules. In reading this book, seems to me you're not particularly fond <laughs> of Trump okay. referring to him as a, a narcissist, a, a peacock. Uh, did you try to talk to him for this book? Um, you know, no, I interviewed him. This is a book, you know, I should explain it. It's, it's a book of cultural criticism. I approached it as a TV critic, doing research, watching, uh, 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 you know, uh, archival tapes and so forth. Um, so, you know, I didn't discover the Hidden Apprentice tapes or whatever. I did, <laughs> in fact, uh, interview Donald Trump uh, in another life, uh, uh, back when he was launching The Apprentice uh, at the end of 2003, when it was going to start in 2004. Uh, and, you know, at the time, it was a very different impression because I got this, you know, image of him as, you know, at the time, he was a celebrity launching a product who wanted people to like him and sort of a nostalgia figure. Uh, and yet, you could see a lot of the President Trump that we see at the time, sort of hard to keep on a topic. Uh, you know, very interested with impressing you, very, very interested in image. But no, you know, I was approaching really not the person Donald Trump, but the character Donald Trump, who in many ways has been more consequential. And perhaps they are one and the same. It's really hard to tell. Um, I don't know if he knows the difference at this point. Did Trump win the 2016 election by treating it like it was a reality TV show? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, at least that was a big part of it. There were cultural factors. There were political factors. Uh, you know, there, there were so many factors. But, you know, just one thing that you can directly apply is that when he started the Republican campaign, which, you know, like the Democratic campaign, started off with a huge field, 16, 17 people, he recognized, you know, what is that? That's the size of an apprentice cast. It's the size of a survivor cast. And he realized this is a reality TV elimination competition. And the way you succeed in that is that you start fights. You make sure that you get attention because the worst thing that can happen is to just get edited out of the story. Uh, you know, so when the pundits would be looking at him and seeing him, you know, launch some uh, egregious attack on the stage, they'd say, why is he getting in this pointless fight? In reality TV, no fight is pointless because the fight shows that you're a fighter and that worked very, very well for him. And the fight is what gets the cameras focused on you. It keeps the red light on you, yes. Is the Trump media playbook now the new norm for presidential candidates? I don't think that anybody who wants to get elected president has to be Donald Trump. There may not be, you know, that many more. You know, he's a unique figure in many ways, a, a longtime celebrity who entered politics. Um, but I think that the circumstances that created Donald Trump are not going away. Uh, you know, television and the electronic media generally, they're the nervous system of our society. It's how we communicate to each other. And like it or not, um, even if you have great policies and great plans and noble ideas and purposes, you have to figure out how to get attention and to tell a story that hits people on a gut level and you know get the spotlight of it because that is how you make yourself the protagonist of that story that is the election. And briefly, this book isn't just about Trump, as you said, it's also the history of American television. What does the next chapter of TV look like? Um, it looks like a lot more in a lot more places. It's going to be, you know, uh, you know, we've already entered the streaming era and at some point you're going to get it downloaded directly into your brain, I assume. And then got to get in this last question. You're the TV critic for the New York Times, besides, of course, Chicago tonight. What else should viewers be watching this fall? Um, I absolutely love a new show on Amazon called Undone, which is this uh, wonderfully animated uh, adult dramedy from the creator of BoJack Horseman, which I also suggest that people watch when, when it comes back. Two recommendations there from James Ponowazic. Thanks so much for joining us on Chicago Tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Again, the book is called Audience of One, Donald Trump, Television and the Fracturing of America. Now, Brenda, back to you. Thanks, Amanda. Brilliant artwork made from glass is lighting up an historic Chicago home. Louis Comfort Tiffany led an all-star team of artists and designers who could create almost anything out of glass. 
Tiffany and Company made lamps, jewelry, mosaics, and also artwork of a spiritual nature. Radiant stained glass glows inside a 19th century Chicago mansion. These sacred scenes decorated U.S. churches and synagogues of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Eternal Light, the sacred stained glass windows of Louis Comfort Tiffany is the very first exhibition to focus solely on the religious windows. The luminous artwork is on view at the Driehaus Museum. Originally the Nickerson House, it was built on the near north side in 1883 for Samuel Nickerson, a banker and one of the founders of the Art Institute of Chicago. It was an era called the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age with its superabundance of wealth, the rise of this industrial class, uh, the emergence of the United States as a, as a, a world power, uh, all these things lent to this extraordinary expansion. Uh, economically, socially, and new buildings and new businesses and new places of worship. Works on loan from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York show how the works were planned. We have preparatory drawings by Tiffany and his studio for the windows in the exhibition. These drawings have been reunited with their windows for the very first time in over a hundred years since the windows were created. The works were made from separate pieces of glass. Visitors are not allowed to touch these masterful windows, but they can get a feel for their texture at a separate display. It's really remarkable to look at uh, these stained glass windows, especially now that we're seeing it in this raking light. Uh, you see the texture of the glass. Tiffany paints with glass, and here you see how he takes uh, up to three panes of glass, could be differently colored, textured, etc to build up, and they play, it's called plated glass, meaning they're plating them one on top of the other right here, so to create that sense of depth, it's remarkable artistry. Also on view, an altar cross that promoted Tiffany and Company at Chicago's World's Fair in 1893. We're looking at old material in a new light, looking at these beautiful objects, but looking at them as signs and evidence of manifestations of social and economic change. The exhibition is called Eternal Light, the Sacred Stained Glass Windows of Lewis Comfort Tiffany. It's at the Driehaus Museum until March. Up next, a writer who's trying to improve higher education. Stay with us. College admissions have been major news in recent months after the so-called Varsity Blues investigation came to light. Last week, actor Felicity Huffman received a two-week jail sentence for her role in the scandal. But the rich and famous gaming the system is one of many ways higher education is stacked against people of modest means. For more young Americans, it's becoming harder to get in, harder to pay for, and harder to succeed. Author Paul Tuff chronicles those struggles in the new book, The Years That Matter Most, How College Makes or Breaks Us. And Paul Tuff joins us now, a longtime education journalist. He's written three other books, including the best-selling How Children Succeed. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. Thank you. Great to be here. So, Varsity Blues. Other defendants in that case, uh, actress Lori Laughlin and her husband, designer Massimo Giannulli, they think what they did was not wrong and they are fighting it. Are there a lot of other parents who feel similarly? Yes, I mean, the, these parents definitely crossed a line, assuming that what they're accused of, they actually did. But I, I feel when I read the FBI wiretaps of all of these parents, what really struck me was that they didn't sound like they were in the middle of a con criminal conspiracy. They sounded like every other put upon affluent parent f f who feels like the college admissions uh, system is just crazy and out of control. I think when a lot of parents are faced with this uh, system that gives them certain advantages, they think, well, it's rigged, so we might as well just rig it a little bit more. Um, and these parents went over an extra line. 
You tell many stories, many personal stories in the book, and it begins with a young woman from the Bronx named Shannon. Tell us her story. Yeah, Shannon Torres. So uh, when I met her, she had just finished her junior year, um, and I followed her through her senior year of high school, and I happened to be with her on the day that she was getting her acceptances uh, or rejections. Well, you find out if you read the book. Yeah, read the book. Uh, from uh, some Ivy League colleges, and she was a fantastic student, top of her class. Uh, but when I was with her that afternoon on this park bench in Harlem, she was just so overwhelmed by the stress of whether or not she would get in. And that conversation, which is what I start off the book with, to me just exposed how much pressure we put on young people and they put on themselves and the system puts on them um, to get into the, the top institutions. Now, Shannon has that pressure, but some well-off, better-off students have that same pressure. Um, and you profile a $400 an hour SAT tutor whose job seems to be as much therapist as it is actual tutoring. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, this is Ned Johnson <laughs> in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Um, and so at the same time that I was spending time with Shannon Torres, I was spending time with Ned and his students, and there were certain parallels. There was the same level of anxiety, but the level of advantage was vastly different. And it was part of what made me feel like um, college admissions in general, and especially the sort of uh, standardized test, the SAT and the ACT, that Ned was preparing his students for are just not a fair uh, measure of, of who should get in where. Ned was able to increase his students' scores by uh, hundreds of points on the SAT, by five or six or seven or eight points on the ACT, um, and that was just money buying advantage. So um, to call this a fair system, a meritocracy, didn't seem right. Um, so you, one of the things along those lines, you write, quote, high school grades considered alone made for a fairly level playing field for students from different economic backgrounds, but SAT scores tilted that playing field in favor of the rich. How's that? So there's data that the College Board, which uh, oversees the SAT, puts out that shows that there is, there is and has been for a long time this real gap in SAT scores and also AC ACT scores by family income. There's a real correlation. The more money your family makes, the higher your SAT and ACT scores. There's much less of a correlation with, uh, with GPA, with high school grades. Um, so in any high school, there are great students earning great grades. Um, and when those students are, are admitted to the kind of institutions that they deserve to go to, they may sometimes struggle at first if their high schools didn't have the same resources. Um, but in institution after institution that I was able to report at, I, could, I watched as these students really succeed. And that, to me, is why um, using high school grades, giving them more weight than SAT and ACT scores makes a lot of sense to me. No. Now, the College Board, which, as you mentioned, administers the SATs, touted lots of changes. The adversity score, which was uh, given a different name, I think, mm -hmm. landscape more recently among them, um, in recent years to improve equity. But you don't quite buy into what the College Board is selling. Yeah, so I reported this book for six years, and that happened to be during this period that the College Board was trying to uh, either remake their own relationship with equity in higher education or remake how we, the public, think about their relationship to equity in higher education. Um, and so they kept introducing one new uh, program after another that was supposed to level the playing field. And so since I had so much time to report on them, I was able to watch as these uh, programs would sometimes um, start off with a lot of hype and turn out to not have a huge effect. Um, and so to my mind, you know, the SAT is just, the, the correlation are very clear between SAT scores uh, and family income. Uh, the College Board wants, I think, to, to either persuade us that that's not true or to push it in a different way. Right, and the College Board has disputed your claims. They say that, you know, grades taken along with SAT scores are actually an indicator um, of, of whether or not a student will succeed in school among some other measures. They say they actually did share some research, um, though it took some years for them to actually disseminate that research. Yeah, so, I mean, the one thing that everyone agrees on is that uh, um, SAT scores and, and grades tend to correlate, uh, that grades are a better measure taken alone, and that if you add SAT scores, they give you a slightly better indication of whether a student is going to succeed. But what a lot of the admissions officers I talked to, including the former admissions director at DePaul uh, University here, uh, said is that, well, for that little bit of extra um, certainty about who's going to succeed, what you get is a whole lot of inequality. Uh, and so to him, when he took, he helped take DePaul University test optional, meaning that students no longer have to submit their test scores. And to him, he wasn't saying, well, the SAT doesn't give you additional certainty. He was saying the trade-off for that uncertainty isn't worth it in terms of how much the test discriminates against low-income students. Now, you're also critical of the weight given to the U.S. News & World Report uh, best colleges and universities ranking, which were actually the new ones released just a week or so ago. Yes. How should parents and students 
view this list? I mean, I think this list looks like it's very scientific, right? <laughs> but every year, it's just some magazine editors deciding what they're going to put, put uh, give weight to, and it changes somewhat every year. Um, in some ways, I think the changes that they've introduced over the past couple of years have been in the right direction, but they still tend to correlate with money, right? So the institutions uh, that are at the top of the list are always the institutions that have the wealthiest students and the biggest endowments uh, and the highest SAT scores. Um, and you know, those, those institutions do have a lot of advantage, but they don't really Really tell us which institutions are improving lives the most, either for individual students or for the country as a whole. You write about how some schools will actually um, consider in their admissions the impact that a certain student's admission would have um, on that weight if a student has a lower SAT score. How much weight should schools and universities and admissions offices be giving this list? I mean, I think it would be great if they could give it a lot less, but the reality is that, that parents, whatever we tell them, parents take this very seriously, and, and uh, high school seniors do as well. And so people in the admissions office are kind of trapped, even when they want to uh, get fairer in terms of who they admit, get broader, have a more diverse class. Uh, the, the pressure of staying, hi staying highly ranked on the U.S. news list means that they have to keep admitting the sort of students they've admitted before, which often means high-income students with high SAT scores, whether they got that um, uh, through their own uh, work in school or through the kind of test prep tutor that I spent time with. Um, you also write about sort of a secret side of col the college admissions process, the financial aid optimization consultants, which are a bunch of qualitative analysts. What are they doing? Yeah, these, <laughs> these like math PhDs sitting in a room somewhere with giant computers. And what they're figuring out is how much financial aid it will take to get any one student to show up at any one university. This is something I didn't realize before I did my reporting, but the job of being an admissions officer now is unbelievably difficult and unbelievably complicated. Um, you've got to figure out exactly which which uh, students to offer admissions to, uh, and then you've got to figure out whether they're going to accept your offer. And so tuition discounting is a big thing. Not everyone, everyone pays a different amount. Every freshman is paying a different tuition. Um, and so these financial aid optimization analysts are the ones who say, this student will show up if you offer them $10,000 off, but not if you offer them $9,000 off. And I think I misspoke earlier. It should be quantitative analysts, sure. not. Okay, um, so how do schools end up, they end up giving more institutional aid to wealthy families than the low income. How does that happen? Well, um, on the whole, the it, U.S. colleges as a whole, they give more aid to students uh, who have in family incomes over $100,000 than under $20,000. Partly that's because the institutions that are giving out the most money, which are the ones with the largest endowments, are mostly admitting students with a lot of family money. Uh, this economist Raj Chetty from Harvard did uh, an amazing study um, called the Mobility Report Cards, in which he found that at the most selective institutions, Ivy League institutions and similar, uh, students from the top income quintile, the richest kids in the country, make up between two-thirds and three-quarters of each undergraduate student body. And students from the bottom income quintile, low-income students, they make up two or three or four percent. And so there's so many wealthy students, they're getting this you know, financial aid, these tuition discounts in order to show up. That's what skews the overall number so much. So there's this public perception that the selective schools are becoming more economically and ethnically diverse, but even in Raj Chetty's research, that's not quite the, the case. What needs to change? Well, I think there's a couple things that need to change. On the, on the, for those most selective institutions that have lots of money to spend, it's just a question of admissions. They can, they can make certain choices. They can decide who they're going to admit. There are a lot of amazing uh, low-income students who are applying to them. All they need to do is admit them. Uh, more broadly, the problem, I think, is not so much with the private institutions. It is with public institutions. Over the past couple of decades, we as a nation have been pulling back funding from our uh, public institutions of higher education, and those are the institutions that have always been the great engine of social mobility in this country. Until we change that, we're not going to have a real level playing field. Paul Tuff, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Again, the book is called The Years That Matter Most, How College Makes or Breaks Us. You can read an excerpt on our website, where you can also find details about author Paul Tuff's events in Chicago tomorrow and Wednesday night, as well as October 21st. And we're back with more right after this.
It's a job as old as time, but one Chicagoan is beekeeping in her own unique way. We recently brought you this story. Here's Jay Shevsky with another look. It's a passion that's not for the faint of heart. But for graphic designer turned beekeeper Jana Kinsman, it's a labor of love. So this is probably 60 pounds of honey. 60 pounds? Yeah. Kinsman was bitten by the beekeeping bug after taking a class at the Chicago Honey Co-op in 2011. Look at that. Beautiful. She then did an apprenticeship with a beekeeper in Eugene, Oregon. And with that experience, she knew she wanted to bring her skills back to Chicago. Today, Kinsman is harvesting honey at the Experimental Station, which hosts the 61st Street Farmer's Market. Kinsman has enlisted the help of Madeline Bordenko. She's one of the staffers at the Experimental Station, and this is her first time harvesting honey. Each box houses nine frames that the bees use as their home base. They can fly up to five miles in their hunt for flower nectar. Honey is concentrated flower nectar. So this hive has been growing and uh, growing and searching for flower nectar since we started it here in uh, April. Kinsman has about 40 hives around the city, as far south as Chatham and as far north as Pilsen. So you go on the far side. What makes this so remarkable is that the majority of her work is done by bicycle. What are you doing? Uh, there's a beehive back here. We just harvested about 120 pounds of honey. Whoa! But why by bike? The idea was hatched during her apprenticeship in Oregon. And I made a joke, like, I'm going to do this when I go back to Chicago, but I'm going to do it on my bicycle since I don't own a car. And at that time, I wanted to just prove that you could do anything by bicycle. On this day, Kinsman will bike her 120-pound load from the experimental station on 61st and Blackstone, about five and a half miles to her workshop in Chicago's Back of the Yards neighborhood. The plant is a former meat processing facility located in the vicinity of the old Union stockyards. It's been turned into this 93,000 square foot space for small food businesses. A successful Kickstarter campaign helped Kinsman launch Bike a Bee in 2012. She asked various community gardens to host her hives and nearly all said yes, including here on the roof of the plant but there was a steep learning curve during her first season. It was a drought year and the hives did not even make enough honey for them to survive the winter. So it was really difficult. And then the next spring I had to raise more money to keep the project going. In addition to a few business roofs, Kinsman also has hives in public community gardens and urban farms. She bikes to all 40 hives every seven to 10 days to make sure the queens are healthy, the hives haven't been vandalized, and to check whether it's time to harvest the honey. Back in her workshop, Kinsman scrapes off the wax cap that's holding the honey in place and saves it for candles and other products she's developing. After that, the honey-soaked frame is put into a centrifuge and spun in both directions to extract every drop. The golden liquid is then poured through a fine strainer to get out any debris. I love to just sit down and at the end of the season just taste all of them back to back and kind of see how they compare. Kinsman estimates that she'll harvest between 50 to 60 gallons of honey this summer. Despite the sweet benefits, beekeeping is serious business and isn't for everyone. But if you want to help bees flourish, Kinsman has a simple suggestion. If you want to help bees, think more about how you can benefit all insects with your backyard. Planting native flowers, um, not spraying your lawns, letting the clover grow, letting the dandelions grow, like that benefits all insects. Kinsman has been stung over the years, but sees it as a minor hazard of the job, like biking in Chicago traffic. I really love beekeeping and I love the animal husbandry of it, but my goal is to have th that side of it kind of uplift the education efforts through community gardens to get more of Chicagoans engaged in nature and in bees. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Jay Shevsky.
And by the way, no bees, camera operators, producers, or helpers were harmed in the filming of this piece. And if you're interested in Jana Kinsman's honey, you can find it at the 61st Street Farmers Market and online. You can find information and more from our conversation with Jana Kinsman on our website. Before we go tonight, some viewer feedback. A proposed congestion tax for vehicles driving downtown is being floated as a way to reduce gridlock and raise revenue for the city. Some of you want politicians to pump the brakes on this idea, while others approve. Let's tax people trying to get to work who don't have a choice on when they can go to work. Great idea. So you have to pay a toll to get into congestion and then a tax. Got it. Enough already. We're tired. Hasn't the city grabbed us by the ankles, turned us upside down, and shaken all the money they possibly could out of us? Get rid of the nonsensical spending already. This is a wonderful idea. Not only will it raise much needed revenue, but it'll cut down on the number of suburbanites living in far flung places, clogging our roads with their cars. This will get people to take CTA, PACE, and METRA, which will also help keep the air cleaner. Chicago, in my opinion, has some of the best transportation options in the country. I'll never understand why there are so many cars driving into the loop every day. Tax the Ubers and Lyft. There's your congestion. Nothing the mayor comes up with will work to clear the deficit. They don't know how to manage money. Taxing the residents is all they know how to do to try and fix the problem. Also, for the first time in 30 years, vinyl records are being made in Chicago. We took you on a tour of the record plant, Smashed Plastic. Here's what some of you had to say. The sound is so much better. I love music, but I hate to say vinyl is too much of a pain to deal with. It takes up too much room, worrying about scratches, flipping sides. Just not worth the trouble, in my opinion. Totally overrated. Everything old is new again. As always, we appreciate hearing from you. Join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter or post your comments on our website. And that's our show for this Monday night. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. We hear from State's Attorney Kim Fox Her about mother. the tens of thousands of marijuana-related convictions January being expunged and more. Plus, a traditional country group from Chicago gives their take on filmmaker Ken Burns' new country music series. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Robert Clifford is the honoree of this year's Illinois Bar Foundation's annual fundraising event that raises money to enhance the availability of justice for those without attorneys throughout the state.